last time you were here, uh, you spoke about how when you go overseas, you are given access to the mass media. But here, that doesn't seem to be the case. Has that changed at all? Have you ever been invited to appear on uh, Nightline or Brinkley? Yes, I have a couple times been invited to speak on Nightline. I uh, couldn't do it. I had another talk and something or other. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't really care very much. FAIR, the media monitoring group, published a very interesting study of Nightline. It shows that their conception of a spectrum of opinion is ridiculously narrow, at least by European or world standards. Let me tell you a personal experience. I happened to be in Madison, Wisconsin, on a listener-supported radio station, community radio station, a very good one. I was having an interview with the news director. I've been on that program dozens of times, usually by telephone. And he's very good. He gets to all sorts of people. And he started the interview by playing for me a uh, tape of an interview that he had just had and had broadcast with the guy who's uh, some mucky muck in Nightline. I think his name is Jeff Greenfield or some such name. Does that name mean anything? I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in New York. What about uh, just in the selection of guests to analyze things? Why is Noam Chomsky never on Nightline? I, I couldn't begin to tell you. He's one of the leading intellectuals in the entire world. Well, I have no idea. I mean, I can make some guesses. Uh, he may be one of the leading intellectuals who uh, can't talk on television. You know, that's a standard that's very important to us. If you've got a 22-minute show and a guy takes five minutes to warm up, now, I don't know whether Chomsky does or not, uh, he's out. One of the reasons why Nightline has the usual suspects is one of the things you have to do when you book a show is know that the person can make the point within the framework of television. And if people don't like that, they should understand it is about as sensible to book somebody who will take eight minutes to give an answer as it is to book somebody who doesn't speak English. But in the normal given flow, that's another culture bound thing. We've got to have English speaking people. We also need concision. So Greenfield, or whatever his name is, hit the nail on the head. The U.S. media are alone in that, that it is, you must meet the condition of concision. You've got to say things between two commercials or in 600 words. And that's a very important fact because the beauty of concision, you know, saying a couple of sentences between two commercials, the beauty of that is that you can only repeat conventional thoughts. I was reading Chomsky 20 years ago. I think his notion, he, doesn't he have a, didn't he co-author a new book called Engineering Consent or the Manufacturing of Consent? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that stuff to me looks like it's from Neptune. This is the first time the Neptune system has been seen clearly by human eyes. These pictures, taken only hours ago by Voyager 2, are its latest contribution. You know, he's perfectly entitled to say that I, I'm seeing it through a prism too. But my view of that, of, of his notions about the limits of debate in this country, is absolutely wacko. Suppose I get up on Nightline, say, and I'm given whatever it is, two minutes, and I say Gaddafi's a terrorist, Khomeini's a murderer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Russians, you know, invaded Afghanistan, all this sort of stuff. I don't need any evidence. Everybody just nods. On the other hand, suppose you say something that just isn't regurgitating conventional pieties. Suppose you say something that's the least bit unexpected or controversial. Suppose you say... I mean, the biggest international terror operations that are known are the ones that are run out of Washington. Or suppose you say... What happened in the 1980s is the U.S. government was driven underground. Suppose I say the United States is invading South Vietnam, as it was. The best political leaders are the ones who are lazy and corrupt. If uh, <laughs> the Nuremberg laws were applied, uh, then every post-war American president would have been hanged. The Bible is one of probably the most genocidal book in our total canon. Education is a system of imposed ignorance. There's no more morality in world affairs fundamentally than there was in the time of Genghis Khan. They're just different, you know, they're just different factors to be concerned with. Now, Chuck, see, thank you. Well, you know, people will reason quite reasonably expect to know what you mean. Why did you say that? I never heard that before. Uh, if you said that, you better have a reason, you know, you better have some evidence. In fact, you better have a lot of evidence, because that's a pretty st startling comment. Uh, you can't give evidence if you're stuck with concision. You know? That's the genius of, these, of this structural constraint. 
And in my view, if people like, say, Nightline and McNeil Lehrer and so on were smarter, if they were better propagandists, they would let dissidents on, let them on more, in fact. The reason is that they would sound like they're from Neptune. Then comes our special conversation on the Middle East crisis. Tonight's is with the activist, writer, and professor Noam Chomsky. Again, there is, has been an offer on the table, which we rejected, an Iraqi offer last April, okay, to, I have uh, to uh, uh, eliminate their chemical and other unconventional arsenals if Israel were to simultaneously do the same. Have to we end it there. It, but I think that should be pursued as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I have to end it there. That's the end of our time. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much for joining us. AT&T has supported the McNeil Lehrer News Hour since 1983 because quality information and quality communications is our idea of a good connection. AT&T, the right choice. Oh, okay. okay. If you just have, can you just sit there for half, half a second? It's just yeah. for two shots, that's all, and we can do everything else. Okay. Okay. It, yeah, what about the, uh, well, I the mic? Is I, 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 I think there's okay. some stuff okay. hanging around there. Right, the idea of this one is it's just a shot where I'm seen talking to you and you're seen listening to me. I'll ask you, though, if you don't speak to me or move your lips so that I can be seen to be asking you a question. The reason for the shot is simply this. I'm used to it. Okay, <laughs> just don't talk to me and I'll keep going. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, the reason for the shot, I'll explain it through because I usually find that's the easiest way to do it. The reason for this shot is I need a shot where you're sitting and seeing, listening to me while I'm asking you a question. We can use the shot to introduce you, explain who you are, where you fit into the piece I'm doing. But if you don't speak to me, I can also use... Got it? Okay. Thanks for your time. Right on. If there is a narrow range of opinion in the United States, and it is harder to express a, a variety of, of different opinions, why do you live in the U.S.? Well, I think it's, well, first of all, it's my country, and secondly, it's in many ways, I, as I said before, it's the freest country in the world. I mean, I think there's more possibilities for change here than in any other country I know. But again, comparatively speaking, it's the country where the state is probably most restricted. But isn't that what you should be looking at comparatively rather yes, than in I absolute do. terms? But of you course, don't, you don't do. create on that impression. On the well, maybe I don't give the impression. I certainly say it often enough. What I've said over and over again and I've been saying it all tonight, I've written it a million times, is that the United States is a very free society. Uh, it's also a very rich society. Of course, the United States is a scandal from the point of view of its wealth. I mean, given the natural advantages that the United States has in terms of resources and uh, lack of enemies and so on, the United States should have a level of health and welfare and so on that's, you know, an order of magnitude beyond anybody else in the world. We don't. The United States is last among 20 industrialized societies in infant mortality. That's a scandal of American capitalism. And it ends up being a very free society, which does a lot of rotten things in the world. Okay? There's no contradiction there. I mean, you know, Greece was a free society by the standards of, that, of Athens. You know, it's also a vicious society from the point of view of its imperial behavior. There's virtually no correlation between the, int, maybe none, between the internal freedom of a society and its external behavior. Uh, you, you, you start your line of discussion at a moment that is historically useful for you. you that's the I grand you pick the, you fact pick the beginning. of you the post-war world right. is that the communist, communist imperialists, by the use of terrorism, by the use of by the deprivation of freedom, uh, have contributed to the continuing bloodshed. And the sad thing about it is not only the bloodshed, but the fact that they seem to dispossess you of the power of rational May I, may I say something? Sure. Yeah. I think that's about 5% true, mm -hmm. and about, or maybe 10% true. It certainly well, is true. Why do you give that? Uh, may I complete a sentence? Sure. I mean, it's, it's perfectly true that there were areas of the world, in particular Eastern Europe, where, uh, where Stalinist imperialism uh, uh, very brutally uh, took control and still maintains control. But there are also very vast areas of the world where we were doing the same thing. And uh, there's quite an interplay in the Cold War. You see, the, what you just described is a, I believe, a mythology about the Cold War, which might have been tenable 10 years ago, but which is quite inconsistent with contemporary scholarship. Ask a Czech. Ask, ask a Guatemalan, ask a Dominican, uh, ask a person from the Dominican Republic, ask, you know, ask a, you uh, ask you, a person from well, South Vietnam, you know, ask yeah, a Thai. Well, well, obviously, say, we can't get away. If you can't distinguish between the nature of our uh, venture in Guatemala and the nature of the Soviet Union's in Prague, What's then the we have real difficulty. Well, explain, explain the difference. Sorry. Uh, now, what about making the media more responsive and democratic? Well, there are very narrow limits to that. It's kind of like asking, how do we make corporations more democratic? Well, the only way to do that is get rid of them, you know? I mean, if, if you have concentrated power, 
you can, I mean, I don't want to say you can do nothing, like you can, you know, like the church can show up at the stockholders meeting and start screaming about not investing in South Africa. And sometimes that has marginal effects. I don't want to say it has no effects. But you can't really affect the structure of power because if you, I mean, to do that would be a social revolution. And unless you're ready for a social revolution, that is power is going to be somewhere else, uh, the media are going to have their present structure and they're going to represent their present interests. Now that's not to say that one shouldn't try to do things. I mean, it makes sense to try to push the limits of a system. It only takes one or two people that think they have integrity as journalists to give yeah. you some good press. See, that's important, and that goes back to something that came up before. I mean, there's a lot, you know, pe there are contradictions, you know, things are, con are complex. It's not monolithic. I mean, the mass media themselves are complicated institutions with internal contradictions. So on the one hand, there's the commitment to indoctrination and control. But on the other hand, there's the sense of professional integrity. She works alone as her own boss writing newspaper columns and producing radio commentaries for a hodgepodge of small clients across the country. This so-called leather lung Texan has been firing questions at our chief executive for almost 40 years. And many a young man in this country is being disillusioned totally by his government these days. Well, this is a question which you very properly bring to the attention of the nation. It's not that we haven't been holding press conferences. I was just waiting for Sarah to come back. Mr. President, that's very nice of you, and I appreciate it. Sarah, I want to call your attention to a real problem we've got in this country today. Those unique and often terrifying McClendon questions reflect her desire to dig out information. And I want to ask your new man what he feels about <laughs> With enough know-how and persistence, she usually gets her man. What would you do if you were in a situation where you were trying to be an honest reporter and you were worried sick about your country and you saw how sick it was and uh, you were facing this weak White House and a weak Congress uh, as a reporter, what would you do? I think there are a lot of reporters who do a very good job. In fact, I have a lot of friends in the press who I think do a terrific job. What well, I, I know they are, but I mean, they want to, but now what... what well, you, got, you, you have to... First, first, I mean, first of all, you have to understand what the system is. And smart reporters do understand what it is. You have to understand what the pressures are, what the commitments are, what the barriers are, and what the openings are. Like right after the Iran-Contra hearings, a lot of good reporters understood, well, things are going to be a little more open for a couple of months. So they could ram through stories that they knew they couldn't even talk about before. After Watergate. Uh, and, and the same after Watergate. And then, you know, it closes up again and so on. Most people, I imagine, simply internalize the values. Uh, that's the easiest way and the most successful way. You just internalize the values and then you regard yourself in a way correctly as uh, acting perfectly freely. All right, let's get to the White House now where I think veteran uh, correspondent uh, Frank Sesno could tell us a little bit about self-censorship. That, that, that uh, inertial guidance system is always going on, isn't it? Is there any formal censorship there? Well, there's no self-censorship, uh, Reed. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to pass it on unless there's a particular and compelling reason not to. I can't deny that I wouldn't like to have access to the Oval Office and all the same maps and charts and graphs that the President's looking at, but that's not possible, it's not realistic, and it's probably not even desirable. How are you? Can I sit down there, please? Yes. Welcome to Holland. Ik, uh, I'll introduce you first in a few lines. Uh, Professor Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, is nu zes en is ongeveer de meest uh, controversiële intellectueel van Amerika. Dat is ook alweer een platitude, maar zo wordt hij nu eenmaal altijd genoemd. Chomsky has been called the Einstein of modern linguistics. The New York Times has said he's arguably the most important intellectual alive today. But his presence here has sparked a protest. This book that has, has poisoned the world and all liar in there. And as a Vietnamese people, we come here to burn the book. Vietnam! 